Good evening. Welcome to the City of Capitola Planning Commission meeting of October 5th. This meeting is open to the public with both in-person attendance at the City of Capitola Council Chambers at 420 Capitola Avenue and remote attendance. Planning commissioners and staff are attending in person and remotely via Zoom. There are several ways for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting via Zoom and make public comments during the meeting is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, on the meeting agenda. The public can also live stream the meeting on the city's website or on YouTube. As always, this meeting is cablecast live on Spectrum Communications, Cable TV Channel 8, and AT&T UVerse Channel 99, and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Mondays and Fridays at 1 p.m. on Spectrum Channel 71 and Spectrum Channel 25. A recording of the meeting will also be available on the city's website after the meeting. Our technician tonight is Walter, and as a reminder, please turn off your cell phones during the meeting. So we will have a roll call. Commissioner Esty. Present. Commissioner Jensen. Present. Commissioner Wilk. Please unmute yourself, Commissioner Wilk. Sorry, here. <laughs> Vice Chair Christensen. Here. And Chair Westman. Here. Thank you. Okay, we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. The Next item is oral communications, and um, the first one is additions and deletions to the agenda. And I know we've had some additional materials that are available for the public on the table, and staff can mention if they would like. But I would also like to, to ask the planning commissioners if we could rearrange our agenda slightly. Um, and that's on two items to move, uh, they're all on the public hearings, to move 421 Riverview Avenue to be the last item on the agenda because both Commissioner Welk and I have to recuse ourselves from that and I know Commissioner Welk is evidently trying to catch a plane. And um, in that note too, I would like to move item D, the colors and materials discussion, before we talk about the citywide housing element, because I believe we've gotten some new information on the housing element as late as yesterday, and staff has been working on that. So I think the housing element item is going to take a little longer than we had originally anticipated. And I guess there is a third one. Uh, it would be nice if our director could do the director's report under staff comments so Commissioner Wilk and I would be available to hear that. So if you're in agreement with that, anyone has, no one has any objections, that's how we will change the agenda for tonight. Um, anything else from staff on the agenda? Good evening, commissioners. We would just like to inform you that staff has received three additional materials for tonight's agenda. Those are for items 5C and 5D. They've been added to the agenda packet and presented to you as well at the dais. Thank you. Okay, the next item on our agenda, did anyone have anything else? The next item on our agenda is public comments. Can you hear me? Sorry, I had one thing to add to. All right, Sean. Yes, for the item four B, excuse me, five eleven Escalona Drive. We'd like to note that if the planning commission uh, does make a motion on that while it's still on consent, uh, staff recommends that they modify condition of approval number number four and uh, replace the word west with east. It's just a cleanup that uh, Commissioner Esty had noted. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, moving on to public comment. Um, this item is for a short communication from the public concerning items that are not on tonight's agenda. Uh, all speakers are requested to print their name uh, if you would like to have your name accurately recorded in the minutes. Members of the public may speak up to three minutes, um, and we look forward to hearing from you. Hi. Hi. My name is Goran Klapic. I uh, worked here one time, excuse me, okay. I worked here one time security uh, in uh, Capitola many years ago. My main concern uh, today and sometimes also in the past was that uh, I don't know who is doing that, but at Jade Street Park, where the restrooms are, like the men's restroom mm -hmm. that I have to use, uh -huh. there are always uh, paintings. Uh, somebody uh, is idiotic enough to paint over with some illegal paint the doors so that the public works has to come back and uh, rearrange the, everything and uh, put... Uh, money, taxpayers' money uh, uh, in consideration to repair this. And uh, uh, it's not only that. Uh, I've been talking about also about garbage uh, uh, on, on the McDonald's and CVS pr premises, uh, which are accumulating and people are ignorant enough to throw garbage away on the side street. And I don't think this is the responsibility of the state of, of California or uh, anybody to remove it, but uh, you have to uh, take uh, the businesses in uh, uh, accountability. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Thanks for listening. Thank you for your comments. We'll direct staff to notify the appropriate uh, departments about those two problems and um, Hopefully, they can do something about them, particularly the bathrooms at Jade Street. I, that's a public facility that we own, so it should be taken care of. Thank you. Uh, anyone else interested in making a public comment? Seeing none, we will move on to commissioner comments. None at this time. Uh, okay, so then we move to the approval of the minutes for August 17th. Uh, 2023. Uh, does anybody have any corrections or additions they would like to make? I move approval. And then would someone like to make a motion? I'll make, I'll make a motion for approval. Okay, we have a motion and second. Um, all of those in favor of this? I don't think Aye. we have a roll call. Aye. 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 So it passes unanimously. Okay. Excuse me, Chair Westman. Yes. Um, can you hear me? This is Katie. Yes, Director Hurley. Um, I think we skipped over the staff comments, and I was oh, going to do we, my director's we report. Did. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, no problem. So we will go back to staff comments so we can hear from Katie in the earlier part of the meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, I apologize for not being in person tonight, but appreciate the opportunity to bring you updates over Zoom. Um, I just wanted to give you a few updates. Um, in terms of the wharf, the wharf construction has begun and we're anticipating construction to take up to one year. Um, you will recall that the Planning Commission looked at revisions to the bathrooms uh, previously, and also there was tree removals at the entrance to the uh, the road for the wharf. And I just wanted to let you know that those tree removals are still, we still plan on doing the replanting, but due to the construction and also the enhancement project that's occurring is being planned out right now that the trees will be planted, but at the appropriate time, um, once they won't interfere with construction and um, also larger trees are typically available. There's a shortage mm. of trees right now in general for uh, choices. So larger trees we're hoping will be available in the springtime. But I just wanted to let you know that that condition of replanting has not been forgotten. We're just trying to incorporate it correctly into the updated plans and the wharf enhancements. Um, 
I also wanted to let you know that um, the city council approved the contract for the mall redevelopment study for the land use study. So we've, um, we're working with Cosmont to get that started. So I've been working with them uh, this past week on getting them information so that they can launch into that study. Um, also, I had previously mentioned, but I just wanted to bring it up again because it um, is that we we received a REAP 2.0 grant for a total of $128,000. Um, and this will be to implement land use planning methods that are identified in our six cycle RENA uh, or six cycle update for the housing element. So that's great news because as you can see, we're committing to many things uh, within our six cycle and that funding will go a long way. So 128,000. Um, also at 1098 38th Avenue, uh, we've told you before that there is an affordable housing project, 100% affordable, um, around 50 units proposed by Mid Penn. The city council will be looking at approving a loan from the city at their November 9th hearing. And then just wanted to give you a reminder that we have a special meeting coming up on October 19th for the recommendation on the housing element to the city council. So thank you. Those are my updates for this evening. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to ask uh, staff uh, to let prior Commissioner Ruth know about the tree removal and planters um, as part of the wharf project because when he uh, was on the commission, that was an item that he was concerned about. Uh, so if staff could just send him a brief email and update him on that, I would appreciate it. We can do that. Thank you. Okay, so now we're moving on to the consent calendar. And um, we have two items on the consent calendar. And uh, the first one is uh, modifications to permit 220140 for the blanket CDU for street dining decks in Capitola Central Village. And the second item is a design permit amendment uh, for 511 Escalona. And as Sean mentioned, there was a slight change in the um, staff recommendation. Um, would anyone on the commission like to pull either one of these items? I don't need to pull it. I'm just a comment, just to kind of make a comment just regarding 511. I just appreciate that staff work with the applicant in addressing the um, issue with the door that wasn't permitted before and you know working together and cleaning that up so just a comment I appreciate that their time addressing it Good. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who would like to pull either one of these items for a separate discussion seeing no one would someone like to make a motion to approve the consent calendar uh, I'll move that we approve the consent calendar Would, would we have to uh, motion to uh, include that? Include the changes, make them by second. Yeah, I'll second with the changes. Uh, we'll probably do a roll call on this. <laughs> Commissioner Esty. Aye. Commissioner Jensen. Aye. Commissioner Wilk. Aye. Vice Chair Christensen. Aye. And Chair Westman. Aye. Okay, so now we're moving on to the public hearing part of our agenda. And as we have rearranged it, the first item will be uh, what was listed as item B at 1435 41st Avenue, Best Western. Uh, it's a conditional use permit amendment to add five guest rooms by converting double base suites to standard guest rooms. So could we have a staff report, please? Yeah, I'm just loading it now. I'll have a presentation for you in just a second here. Okay. So uh, Best Western at 41st Avenue is proposing a conditional use permit modification. Um, Got an aerial photo here showing the property with parking in the rear and facing 41st Avenue. Uh, was built in circa 2000 with 54 rooms. Uh, the proposal this evening is to add a net of five guest rooms 
uh, by way of internal conversions. So just to get into this, uh, there is no design permit because all of the changes are internal. Um, on the first floor, there was a manager's apartment that took up uh, two bay units. And so the proposal here is to add two net new guest rooms. And then on the second floor, the conversion is, uh, relates to two suites uh, into four standard guest rooms for a net of two more. And then on the third floor, it's a combining one suite for a net of one guest room. So uh, the primary, because all the work is, is interior, uh, the primary planning consideration was parking and the, the property was originally uh, laid out and designed with 60 parking spaces. Current uh, code requires one space per guest room and then one per 300 square feet of office and uh, the combination of office is, is 275 square feet. So there's one space required for office and the proposal is 59 guest rooms. So it complies with current standard with parking. So um, that is it. It's a modification to a use permit. It will require a building permit uh, and building staff has done an interior walkthrough and there will be some amount of uh, likely disassembly or demolition in order to do the permit C or the inspection sequencing that would have gone with the permit. Uh, but with that, uh, we are recommending approval uh, with the amended and updated conditions and findings that are attached. Do any of the commissioners have any questions of staff before we open the public hearing? Just a question. Um, so when you said there's going to be deconstructive work done, so was some work done previously that like is covered up then? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, so there, with these suites specifically, there was half baths uh, where a sink unit was, was converted to a tub and shower. And so the plumbing that was done in the wall, uh, and there may be a new electrical outlet. So that may need to be opened up to see how that was assembled inside the wall. Because uh, if that conversion was proposed and permits were issued prior to the work being done, the inspector would be looking at that in progress as work was completed, so. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, we will open the public hearing on this item. Is there anyone in the public who would like to speak to us about the 1435 41st Avenue project? Seeing no one, is there anyone on Zoom? Uh, so we will close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission. I have no comments. No comments. No comments. Mr. Will? No comment. Okay. So um, would someone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion for approval for the Best Western on 41st Avenue for the okay. approval of changing, I think, was it, well, I guess just the project number 2303.97. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and second. Can we have a vote? Commissioner Esty. Aye. Commissioner Jensen. Aye. Commissioner Wilk. Aye. Vice Chair Christensen. Aye. And Chair Westman. Aye. Okay, so the next item we're going to hear is item D listed on our agenda as colors and materials. And um, this was a topic that the Planning Commission um, decided that they would have a discussion about. So can we have a staff report? Yeah, so I'll be doing this presentation as well. Uh, so this item is before you tonight, uh, primarily for discussion and possibly direction to staff. Uh, and the, the topic being uh, colors and materials that are both required to be submitted and defined in design review applications for single family properties. Uh, and then the second half of it is what does the city's zoning ordinance regulate in terms of colors and materials. So the first part of that is what does uh, staff routinely request of applicants to provide in terms of defining their project for color and materials. And my slide has got two uh, pretty typical exhibits that we'll receive. Uh, the one on the left is, is a little bit more simple, and the one on the right is a rendered elevation with call-outs of different materials. Uh, the one on the right just with uh, 
with written description. So th this is uh, typically what we see. It's in PDF form. We don't ask for physical samples, just uh, uh, typically what fits on a sheet of uh, standard paper, descriptions, and some graphics. Uh, with regard to the, the code, um, there are basically three sections that, um, that deal with uh, requirements for color materials and uh, ADUs and the objective standards do require uh, exterior materials to match the primary structure. And there's a design review criteria that's incorporated into the findings for design review projects uh, by reference, but two of them specifically, uh, A, talks about community character and balance and compatibility with the surrounding area. And then criteria K uh, talks about quality of materials and use of natural materials and long lasting materials. Uh, and then the last one is uh, post decision. Uh, so this would be after a project is, is approved by the planning commission, um, what can staff through the community development director change? Uh, and we, can change up to 25% of the building facade uh, at a post decision level. So I, I believe your item um, on 511 Escalona was before the commission because they had a, a comprehensive change to the exterior. So we had a, a good case in point, but uh, this is what the code lays out uh, relative. So I would note that uh, exterior color paint, uh, applicants maintain that flexibility throughout the process. It's not regulated. And so procedurally, uh, you, you saw on the first slide what we asked for, um, and then you know, we allow a bit of flexibility with how that's presented. Sometimes it's, it's not even a separate sheet. It, if, if their renderings are in the plans and they're descriptive enough, we can accept that. So that is uh, kind of a, a rundown of procedurally and then how uh, the code ties into color and materials for design permits. Be happy to take questions. Does any, do you have any questions before we open the public hearing? Uh, Brian, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I didn't hear you correctly. You said right now that if it's detailed on the plans, it's not required. Is that what you, you say? Sorry. Yeah, so we, we're generally pretty flexible with, um, with how we will accept this information. So a lot of times it is a separate standalone exhibit, and then sometimes the plans are detailed enough to where we don't need that. And that's for materials and colors? Yes. So if they note it on there, it was hardy siding and certain color, and it's a standard color that wasn't up to your discretion would be not needed as an additional uh, item that would be submitted? Correct. Okay, thank you. So I'm more interested in the materials. If, if somebody walks in with a plan and, and it, Kind of looks like a castle. It's got, you know, rocks and, and bricks and that kind of stuff, and it doesn't fit with the community. What's your? What do you do? You, just, you tell them you got to you got to fit within, you know, sort of the guidelines of what the community looks like now. Um, we don't regulate architectural style, so compatibility is is also a subjective concept. So, um, you know, I think within the discussions with staff, we could. Uh, maybe ask an applicant to, to look a second time at the compatibility if we thought it was uh, out of character, but ultimately they would have an option to come before the commission to make to make findings. Okay. Thank you. So we won't open the public hearing. Is there anyone here on in the public who would like to comment about this item? Um, is there anyone in the public on Zoom who would like to comment on this item? Okay, so we'll close the public portion and bring it back to the commission. And I know that uh, Commissioner Wilkes was very interested in this item, so perhaps we can give him the opportunity to speak first. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Commissioner Westman. Um, let me, my arguments basically are in the presentation uh, that's an attachment to the, um, to the uh, agenda. Um, basically, uh, what I want to do is minimize the stress and requirements on applicants. Uh, where, where I'm coming from from this is I was an applicant who went through a planning commission 
and city council review on a, on a major remodel. And I found it very, very stressful. Uh, there was a lot, uh, you know, a lot of ropes you have to pull and hoops you have to jump through. And, and, uh, and I was wondering why, why that is so difficult. So I would, over the course of years, ask Katie things like, well, why do we need a landscape plan? Uh, and she'd give me perfect reason, like, well, you don't want to have roots near a, near a, a power line or, you know, what have you. So a lot of these hoops that you jump through are necessary, but I was never given a, a good reason as to why we needed to specify the color of our house um, before we got approval or to present that particular information to the planning commission. And my thought is, if we can remove some little bit of stress from an applicant who's going through very difficult time trying to get their dream project done, and we could just say, hey, you know what? We're not gonna, we're not gonna ding you on color or tell you that you need to present a color board ahead of time. Maybe you haven't decided on your color yet. Well, can we just take that off the table and, and move one little bit of stress off of the applicant's uh, <laughs> plate? So that, that's kind of where I'm coming from. And like I say, the other arguments I think are in my uh, presentation that you've all read, hopefully, and I don't need to go over those again. So thank you. Who else would like to comment on this? Um, you want to walk? Go oh, sorry. Go so yeah, I, I would agree with Commissioner Wilk on the colors. The, it doesn't. I mean, since you can literally paint your house, go through the approval process, get it all signed off, and the day, next day you could paint it whatever color you wanted, and nobody has any say. It's sort of a silly requirement. I, I don't. I don't think that's true on the material side, like my castle example. I wouldn't want castles to show up in the middle of Capitola because they just don't fit in with these views. Um, but yeah, I, I don't see any need for color. Brittany, do you have uh, any I won't disagree this time. <laughs> um, I agree. So uh, my comment, I guess, goes maybe a little bit farther than um, I think I, I agree completely with the color thing. I can understand the materials. I think uh, a good architect designer is going to obviously have those detailed on a set of plans because usually those are going to be a set of plans that they'll carry forward to go get a bid. And so the more information that's noted on the plans would be they would get a more accurate bid. So I would think a good architect and designer would probably have their information. What I would like to do is expand it and going to what Commissioner S. Um, referred to as, you know, how these projects come in. And I know if we go back and look at the history, and um, I've also built um, my house in Capitola and went through the process. But back in the day, we had the um, architectural review board. And I thought the process was great. Um, I thought to attend it um, in a forum that was just at the back table, it was very positive, shared thoughts back and forth. I went back and looked at some of my notes on, and Katie was here at the time, when suggestions that you know she encouraged me to make changes to the house to you know, that she thought represented capital. And at that time, I was new to the area. And so I thought that was valuable. And so I would like to, and I don't know, you know, if we have to be another item for discussion to be brought up at another meeting, but I would want, I would like to make a recommendation that we looked at bringing that back to have some review on that. And so hopefully um, that provides a little bit more to a client that it's a, a, a less stressful process of having it so formal as submit this, submit that, and going back and forth. I also think it'd be great for staff to have another maybe perspective on, you know, from a professional or a community member who would sit on that group. Um, and so that's what I would like to see. Um, if the, And I don't know what the process would be to have that expanded or what other commissioners' thoughts are beyond that. I also think at the same time, you know, um, I'll bring up the opaque window thing. You know, it seems like um, it's, you know, Staff has a code, it says opaque windows. I think and there's some precedent set by this uh, uh, planning commission that maybe that's a little bit different thought. And so those sorts of things should be kind of looked out and looked over and reviewed at that time. And so that those items maybe would be addressed before they got here and we would understand um, the back and forth about that. I'd also would love to see, and I don't think it was at the time, and maybe it was and no one attended, but also an invitation maybe to the neighbors to come because at the same exact time, I think neighbors might be 
when a plans are so far down and you finally see them and the product's already designed, a neighbor might be out, oh my gosh, you know, that window is going to bother me. But my gosh, if I ask my neighbor that's been 20 years next door to me to move that, that could cost them five or $10,000. Let's say it's a huge structural issue. And so to try to work through some of those things early and the neighbors talked and they said, you know, do you know, you know, and I know we shouldn't be looking at projects from a neighbor perspective because neighbors change, but I think it's just, it allows the community and everybody to work a little bit better together. So those are my couple of my thoughts I'd like to share. Thank you. So um, it seems to me we sort of have three points we need to cover. Um, I have absolutely no concern about what color someone's going to paint their house. And uh, to be honest, in all the years we've been here, I, I can't remember I, I, telling someone to, you know, change their color. I can remember as a staff person asking the applicant if they were really sure that that was the direction that they wanted to go in. But I don't remember the Planning Commission ever denying an application over color. And I don't, I don't think they have to tell us what color they're going to paint their house. So we sort of need to change our definition of facade because, like, um, uh, Paul, I'm very concerned about, you know, the materials side of it. So, you know, in the staff report, we talk about a single-family residential project facade means combination of exterior materials and color, and I think it should just be exterior materials. Uh, we also have one other area in our ADU ordinance, which I, I didn't hear anybody mention, and that's in the ADU ordinance right now. The ADU is supposed to match um, or be compatible color-wise with the existing residents there. So maybe we ought to just get some comments about how you feel about that. So can I, can I jump in? Because sure. I, I would like to limit this to something that everyone can agree to. And I, and I think the notion of having the, can you hear me, by the way? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I, the notion of having the ADU compatible with the existing house, Okay, that that makes it that makes some sense. The notion of uh, specifying materials, I can buy into that. But what I'd like to do, and I would like to move that we recommend to staff that any reference to color, with terms of materials and color board, or any association with color that would associate with the primary building uh, house color, that that be removed and no longer be required. So that's my motion. Yeah. Um, I think that um, typically what we do get on plans, if someone's talking about, you know, stucco or the kind of roof they're going to do, they typically indicate uh, colors of those kinds of materials. And for me, I would like to see the those material colors. Um, you know, we certainly can give staff some flexibility to, uh, you know, modify those. But um, uh, because those are things that are going to be around for a long time. The, the color someone paints their house is pretty transient. Um, you know, it's like a teenage kid dyeing their hair. You know, it's not, it's not a permanent kind of thing. But when you're talking about the roof materials, the siding materials, um, those things, for me, I get, um, it's good to know. And I guess it's really, you know, sort of the roof and windows, because those are the things that probably never would be painted. <laughs> yeah, I guess for, for staff, it, typically you request, you would request the materials to be shown on all the elevation views, right? Yes. Okay, so there's really no need for a separate materials board in that sense. Yeah. Plans were defined to that level. Yeah, we wouldn't need to see color. Yeah, the plans to show it, we don't need anything separate. Right. So should we expand the list beyond just a color board, but a color and materials board? Yes. I remember going through a long time ago, and we actually had to yeah, they do don't, samples in yeah. a materials board. Yeah, they don't need to submit a separate colors and material color and material board as long as the materials and the color of the materials, not the paint on the house, is indicated on the plan. Does that work? 
Yeah, one question, um, just speaking of roofing, as we see a trend of metal roofing, does the city have um, a requirement on the re reflectivity rate on metal roofing? I have not seen a reflectivity value of the zoning ordinance, I don't think. Yeah. I know other cities do have it, and so, okay. especially with metal roofing, so I, 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 I could agree with, you know, not maybe picking out the color, but there are different colors that have a higher reflectivity rate, and so, if you're in a certain area, the rate, reflectivity rate could be very high. And so that'd be just one thing I would caution when you say we remove color, we might want to note that. And I don't know if other commissioners have comments regarding that. I'm I, touching on that. <laughs> the, the reason I disagreed with this before, and I, I acknowledge um, Commissioner Wilkes concern about taking the or alleviating the stress of the submittal process and the planning process. The, the, the only thing that I really value in the colors and materials boards is fleshing out the design and presenting it to the panel, it, or to put, presenting it to the commission. Really having um, intention being brought into your design is part of every jurisdiction, at least I've ever submitted to. So it, it really doesn't, having black and white drawings in front of the commission is great. I think having a really well thought out, fleshed out design makes it complete. And, and having um, voting on something like that really, it, it just kind of drives the point home that we value what our town looks like, you know, how, how it look, you know, where it's the, the, the design intention, you know, the streetscape, everything like that. So although I'm not going to disagree with Commissioner Wilk this time, <laughs> I think um, just touching on that and understanding that, I just don't see any other town or city not requesting colors and not requesting materials and not requesting reflectivity. Um, yeah. I, I, I think for me where I'm, I'm coming from is that I'm concerned about the things that are going to be here for 25, 30 years. Yeah. And that's going to be the roof. That's going to be what kind of siding they're going to use. That's going to be... Are we doing aluminum windows, vinyl clad windows? You know, what, what kind of windows are going to go in? Right. And during that time, people do routinely, I think he's telling us they can't hear, so I'll try and talk into my microphone a little more. Um, I think people do routinely repaint their house during those times, and that's not something the city regulates, so it's not something we should regulate the first time it gets painted. Um, but the, the other parts of it are important to me. And, you know, maybe we're not going all the way that Commissioner Wilkes wanted, but we're making a step to make it easier and not have, you know, the color someone's going to paint their house be an issue. So that's, I mean. While we're talking about it, I do agree with um, I, that our site committee was very effective in kind of, in, uh, helping direct those decisions. But if we're going to limit it to what the motion was um, addressed, then... Right. I, th I think we need to sort of bring up the Arkansas Site Committee as sort of a separate issue because mm -hmm. it's really not part of this agenda item. But, you know, we can bring it up. And I agree with you having us look at bringing back that body because I thought it was very effective. And uh, as Commissioner Jensen said, it was an opportunity for the neighbors, for the staff, for the applicant, and everyone to sit down in a quite informal setting uh, before things got, uh, you know, engineered and uh, final drawings were made. Because um, I agree when you ask people to make changes after there have been final drawings and engineering work and those kinds of things, it does start to get expensive. And, you know, one of our goals later on tonight is to, you know, facilitate having housing built. So uh, I think having that early review would be good. So um, do we want to have a motion on the colors and material boards and the ADU colors? And then we'll go to the Arkansas site discussion. I, th I think he did. Commissioner Wilk, he might have made a, another comment. Did he make a motion? Right. So, so I, if you can hear me, I already made a motion, which was to direct staff to eliminate color from uh, new builds. 
basically agreeing with you that when it comes to materials, the notion of showing the material and its color, uh, you know, with regards to those long-standing things, you're talking about windows, roofs, that that's fine. I am just really worried about exactly what you said, Commissioner Westman, which is I'm painting, I'm getting on a paintbrush and I'm painting my house and I have to tell you ahead of time that I, what color I'm going to buy from Sherman Williams. That's what I object to. And so I would like to staff to come up with appropriate wording in their, uh, in their application to eliminate that concern that they have to supply a color board for the color they're painting the house. Here's, but, but include the notion that, yeah, you have to include the color of the rock that you're, you know, making your chimney with and your roof and whatnot. That's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, to your point of, we want to look at the long standing thing. So, and so again, my, my motion is to direct staff to eliminate color from the requirement uh, on, a, on an R1 applicant. Okay. And just to clarify, you also mentioned in your previous discussion that you have no concern about, there's no need to change our current ADU ordinance Correct. saying that those need to be compatible. So I think Correct. we have a motion. Uh, does everyone understand it? Do we need to? I'm sorry, was that motion just for the color? Okay, the way I understand your motion is that we are going to eliminate a requirement that someone tells us what color they're going to paint their new house or major remodel or whatever, but they will continue to tell us what materials they're going to use and what colors those materials are going to be, like the roof, the window, rock or you know things that are going to be permanent and they have the Correct. option of doing that two ways they can either in staff's interpretation put it on the plan and if the information there is adequate and shows us that's fine if it's not adequate on the plan they would need to separately submit a piece of paper showing them uh, the colors of the permanent items so I think, I think that's what our motion is. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, we probably wanna have a roll call vote. Commissioner Esty. Aye. Commissioner Jensen. Aye. Commissioner Wilk. Aye. Vice Chair Christensen. Aye. And Chair Westman. Aye. Okay, and then the other item was brought up, which um, I think the you know planning commission could direct staff to come back at a uh, later date and talk about um, the architectural and site review committee. Do we need to bring it back? How it worked, and we can have a discussion about that at another time. Is that everybody in agreement with that? Yep. Sure. Okay. Yes. And that does that item. Have a good trip, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> so I believe that Commissioner Wilkes is going to be leaving us now, uh, just as any commissioner would leave a regular planning commission meeting. So they had, so he will no longer be part of our uh, panel or discussions. That will be. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so, very much. Yeah. So now we are going to move on to um, the cities. And I see the applicant here. Um, uh, I know Mr. Norton's representing uh, 421 Riverview Avenue. We did move that item to the end of the agenda because both Commissioner Wilk and I have to recuse ourselves from that item. So we will get to you, it's just gonna be a little later. So the next item is uh, the citywide housing element update and a presentation from our community development director. Okay, uh, good evening, Planning Commission. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes. Okay, um, I, tonight I'm going to be giving you an update on our housing element and we also have our from our city attorney's office, we've got Layla joining us for any uh, technical questions regarding 
housing law. So um, with that, I'm going to jump in. Um, tonight's topics is, uh, first, I'll give you an overview of a housing element just for anyone uh, uh, participating in this call that isn't aware of what a housing element is. And then the majority of my presentation will be on the 90-day review by HCD and the comments that we received and our next steps. Um, so what is a housing element? It simply is, it, we look at um, what our needs are for the community in terms of housing and how we can best accommodate those, our existing needs and our future housing needs. And a lot of that is set up by the state. Um, the date that our housing element is due to the state is December 15th. And right now we are on track. Um, this is showing you the up the update process and we've come quite a, a long way. Um, the past 90 days, our draft housing element has been under review by HCD staff um, and we're moving into adoption hearings next. So this meeting tonight is to update you on what's occurred in the past 90 days with um, the HCD staff. So we've had a really, actually it's been a, a a unique experience, very collaborative with HCD. Um, here on this slide, you're seeing our first public review draft in the back that was submitted, that was published in May to our to the public. Uh, we received, we had public outreach meetings, planning commission, city council meetings. We got a lot of great input. And then we took that input, we revised the draft, and we submit, uh, put it into a draft for July that was submitted to the HCD. So the last time I presented to the Planning Commission on this topic was for that update. Since submitting to the HCD, um, we've received two rounds, well now three rounds of comments from the HCD. And with each round of comments, we have, first I have to just, uh, compliment our team, um, Veronica Tamman Associates, RM Design, and then Layla from uh, BWS. Uh, great team. And the minute we'd get comments and have and hear from the HCD, everyone would go to work um, to revise and it, it, our draft element with uh, strategies that we thought are appropriate for um, the city of Capitola. And then post the revisions for seven days for the public to weigh in. I'd send out emails to all the interested parties. Uh, we'd put updates in our on our website as well as in our newsletter that, that a new draft is available. And, and it worked. We got great thoughtful comments from uh, the mall, Yimby, other local entities such as uh, the RTC. We, we just had a lot of public comment and engagement throughout this process um, and Metro. So then as we, and then we got a second round. So the first round of edits we that went out in the August 29th draft were in red line version. For the September 19th update, we highlighted all those changes in yellow. So you would see all the red lines in, in blue. <laughs> So blue lines, and then with the highlight, the new highlighted areas were the revisions from September, and then most recently, uh, two days ago, I received the 90-day comments from the HCD. Um, so tonight in my presentation, I'll be going over what changes were made during those uh, different iterations that I just showed on that slide. But I'll also be bringing into you what we've heard from the October 3rd HCD letter. So first, I, I want to say that um, all of the uh, direction given by the Planning Commission initially and City Council was well, well received by HCD. And our comment letter um, was five pages long, which is um, really a, a compliment to the work that's been done um, and dedication to housing for this future uh, six cycle. So we're in a really good place. And um, the the remaining items from our October 3rd letter are really requests for additional information and to give more details on some of the items we're proposing and data that exists. They're also asking for more analysis on our mall, the Capitola Mall, where that's such a big part of our housing element update as well as um, programs for housing opportunities within our R1 and multifamily. So you're all familiar with the missing middle um, and 
it's the folks that don't um, qualify for affordable housing opportunities, but they can't because our um, housing is so out of reach, the missing middle doesn't get the same opportunities to purchase homes when they're just above our area median income. And then, so some more, the, the HCD was asking for more in terms of helping the missing middle and mobility into single family neighborhoods, as well as uh, another subject matter is the update to the community benefits overlays, another request of HCD. So with that, I'll jump into what changes have been made. Um, this slide just shows you the different contents within a housing element. So I'm gonna go in order by the, the sections. There's, in the introduction, we provided an overview of the public, the additional public comment made and the responses within the draft. Um, within our housing needs and opportunities, we added um, discussions on trends in redevelopment. We're definitely seeing more applications for housing and not so much for commercial. So when commercial is redeveloped, including uh, housing on the site, which we've seen some examples of that was added. We also had to add criteria of how, how do we determine the sites within the site's inventory. So within the table uh, following the site's inventory, you'll see there's new columns that have been added to discuss what the floor area ratio is, the building age, and the improvements to land ratio to make sure that it's uh, that there's room for, there's opportunity on those sites. So all of that has been added to that table on the sites inventory. And then additional analysis was request was added for uh, density assumptions for our sites inventory, lot consolidation, um, non-vacant sites and why we're the likelihood for redevelopment and then the Capitola Mall site, a lot more detail on the previous application and proposed density and uh, changes to our sites inventory. So I'm gonna, um, with that, the, the in our October, third letter, the HCD is asking for us to elaborate more on the Capitola Mall site and uh, bring forward uh, lease agreements, phasing programs to commit to facilitating redevelopment and, and future monitoring. So our, our team is working on that, um, that information to update. Um, excuse, so excuse me, six like, uh, oh, go ahead. The, go back. Uh, to what exactly is the data on, or the metric, excuse me, on lot consolidation? You say there's a column for that. What is, what are we gonna put in that, that cell for every site? Oh, so for lot consolidation, that would take place on smaller lots in which there's an opportunity there um, to consolidate the lots. So there are quite a few, I think there's, when you look at our map, you'll see there's, um, some of the numbers are followed by a letter and those are the smaller lots that could be consolidated. Um, for one example, that's a larger lot is um, the Sears building and the Takara site. And what it means is that in redevelopment, we foresee those two being redeveloped together. And there's, for sites that um, near the intersection of Capitola Ave and Bay Avenue, there's, there's a property owner that owns multiple sites that are next to each other. So those also are shown as lot consolidations. So we added that column so that uh, to provide more detail for HCD so that they can see the likelihood of those being redeveloped together. You, you think that will address okay. the small sites uh, paragraph in the HCD letter? Yes. Yep. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So we're, I think we're adding a new table to, um, to the, the next version to uh, expand on those lot consolidations and, and why we think they'll be consolidated in the future. Um, okay. My next slide just shows our allocation this time around. So in the fifth cycle, we were assigned 143. I think we're all getting more comfortable <laughs> with our six cycle uh, number of 1,336. Again, as, as the planning commission and as the city, our job here is to plan for the units, but we obviously don't have the funding to actually develop these. So we've got to put the tool, put the uh, land use tools together so that the private sector can develop these. Um, so in terms of our site inventory map during this, the latest revision, um, we removed, in terms of the, 
the mall site, we removed the coals. They do have a long-term lease there. Um, we added the Macy's site because it is dated like the rest of the building and there's an opportunity to do redevelopment there. We removed all the state sites. So uh, I was hoping to get participation from the state. I had reached out to the state parks for New Brighton, um, but it was, uh, there, there was very little response. Um, so the New Brighton State Park site has been removed as well as the DMV. And you, you need a letter from the state with intent to move forward with a project in order for it to be included in your housing element. So with not having that, it's, it's appropriate to remove it at this time to get it certified. And then we added two parking lot areas within shopping plazas. So one is at the Kings Plaza area. We don't, um, we added a, for 50% of the parking area that's there um, to allow that as a site you know, parking would still be required and would have to be replaced and then parking added for housing, but they could go vertical and also at the Bay Avenue site for the part, half of the parking lot. Um, so what did this do to the overall inventory? It created more units within our regional commercial zone um, and also within our community commercial zone. And the units that were added, there's much more to the low and very low inc income um, sections so that when a, a development project comes forward, we will not be at risk of the no net loss. So right now with the updated numbers, we have a healthy 16% buffer, um, which it, when we initiated this project, we really wanted to move forward with a, a healthy buffer being between 15 to 20%. Um, any questions? Okay, so for the mall site, um, and this is at the direction, uh, the, the feedback we we're getting from the mall, as well as from um, YIMBY, the group YIMBY, Santa Cruz, um, the existing lease at Kohl's is a long-term lease, as I mentioned. There's also portions within the Central Mall and the parking areas outside of Target and Macy's that have long-term commitments. Um, so, those we're taking that into consideration in the update by removing the Kohl's site. And then we also got feedback um, of over-reliance on the mall um, and the risk of no net loss findings because so many of the more affordable units would be at the mall site. So that's been amended. The current draft, the original draft had 853 units. The current draft has 641. Um, so, so less less reliance on the mall. Sites. So do you want do you want questions now, or do you want to finish your presentation and have us ask them at the end? Um, it you know questions could be okay as we go through because I don't want to. That's appropriate because right. I'd I'd like to talk about the mall site, but I'll save that till the end. Okay. Um. In terms of constraints section, we added a lot to this area of um, one, one step that we'll be taking is we're going to remove the affordable housing overlay, the density bonus provisions by the state. We've committed to updating our chapter on that, and they are uh, more flexible than our affordable housing overlay, so it doesn't make sense to keep that in play. Um, we've also expanded on... Uh, the information on our tools regarding maximum density, um, also looking at the cumulative impacts to the city's land use controls. We highlight within our constraints the recent efforts regarding ADUs. A lot of uh, cities are committing to many of the steps we've already taken with ADUs with our guidance document and our prototypes. So we've just made sure the HCD is aware of what we've uh, done in the past. There were also questions about residential care facilities and the conditional use permits there, so we've clarified that. Um, and then the, there's updates on, it shouldn't say the city's water rights, but really uh, what, what water is available to the city. We've, we have water available to us through, um, through uh, Santa Cruz water as well as SoCal water districts so we've um we've updated the information on those districts and the and made the finding that there is enough water 
in order to meet our housing needs. Uh, can um, you elaborate a little bit on the tools uh, regarding maximum densities? What's, what are we changing there? So I think it's more of we added an explanation on our, that we uh, have no maximum densities that we allow, um, except so really just that that's a great tool for planning in that um, a developer can come in and build a range of product from many small units to less larger units. So just provided more information to the state on that. Okay, because they seem to think that we have, a, at least in residential area, maximum density of 8.3 units per acre. I don't know how they came up with that number. So that they come up with Seven. because we, we do have a 5,000 square foot um, um, minimum lot size. So that's where that comes into play. So for our single family, we have uh, density limits. Um, but for within our new mixed use and commercial districts, we do not. We, we do have them within our multifamily and single family residential. Okay, that's, okay got it. Because most okay. of them, yeah, it's sort of irrelevant in a lot of cases. Katie, uh, sorry. Um, just on the update of city water rights, um, is that updating? Uh, I know we talked about before regarding the SoCal water treatment that they're going to be doing. Yeah, it talks about uh, we expanded on like um, the study that was done by the city of Santa Cruz, actually, and their findings for what um, how much water they'll be able to deliver in the future with the, their their long range planning, as well as SoCal Creeks. Uh, a new um, strategies for water. So it really, we, I think the information we had in there was not the most current. And actually Commissioner Jensen, I think you brought this up at one of our meetings. So we, we added, it, it's now up to date to reflect the current studies that are out there. Okay. Um, for our housing plan, so this is where we get into our programs and we talk about our deliverables. So housing program 1.1 is to, to provide more diversity in housing to all of capital is for all of capital as residents. And within here we have our ADU assumption. We also have that we're going to be removing um, the affordable housing overlay and that also a, a commitment to when the mall metro station becomes a high frequency transit area that will update our housing documents on that. Um, when we, in our most recent submittal to the state, again, I mentioned this at the very beginning that the state really wants us to figure out more ways in which to provide housing within our single family neighborhoods and create more opportunities for that missing middle. So, um, and they want us to have some strong commitments in there. So this is one of the uh, a kind of a bigger item that I wish uh, I could have incorporated this into your staff report. And I apologize, but it's really with only just getting these comments two days ago, I met with our team. Um, actually, the day we got the comments, we started brainstorming how we can react to these comments or what we can do. And uh, Veronica Tam, recommended that we revisit our uh, low and medium multifamily zones, revisit the density limits, which are pretty low right now. Um, and and we can revisit them and, and consider adding like if uh, the low density, I think, is at 10 units per acre, possibly bumping that up to 12 units per acre. So it incentivizes a developer to come in and rehab and possibly add a couple more units to a site. Um, and then the other strategy, which uh, they've incorporated in other jurisdictions and their housing elements, which the HCD has um, accepted, is to allow duplexes on corner lots within the R1 zone with objective standards. So um, this would, actually allow for a little more variety within our R1. Right now within our R1 district, we have our SB9, which all the units are um, have a maximum square footage allowance of 800 square feet. We also have our ADU standards, which allow different uh, maximum 
floor area based on how many bedrooms. And by allowing duplexes on corner lots, this is just another um, part of the menu that people with single family homes in a corner lot could look at instead of an SB9 or an ADU, they could actually um, modify their home into a duplex. And because it has two front edges on a corner lot, it would be less impactful because you could have an entrance facing each street frontage. So um, I have that in a slide later. All of my recommended actions I have on one, one slide at the end so we can discuss all of these items towards the end. Any questions on that? Before you go too far, just go back one slide. With that 50 ADUs over the next eight year period, that's the assumption? That is the assumption that we could include, and it's based on our last eight year period. So although we're seeing a lot more traction with our ADUs right now, um, that would go beyond this. Based, we have to base it on our last cycle. And do you just know off the top of your head uh, this year how many ADUs so far? You know, I I believe that the um, from November of 2022 till June of 2023, we had or May of 2023. I think we had 11. So I'm not sure if. Um, yeah, that's fine. I was that, just that's, wondering. That's it, the most trending up to date up. number I have. So we're trending up. Um, there's definitely a lot of interest in ADUs these days, and they're you're not seeing it because uh, they're administrative. So in the paragraph where they tell us what to do, um, they have examples of additional things, and one of which is targeting funding. Does that mean we're supposed to fund some development of uh, ADUs and things like that, or what? What do they? What do they want us to do? Um, you know, I think there's different ways we could go about that, but it's most likely applying for grants um, to to uh, bring more um, uh, targeting grants with strategies for that missing middle. So okay. if we could come up with programs within applications to help. So that's I think that's what they're asking to do, but it wasn't specific enough to know. Not, yeah, it's a lot of motherhood in this letter, which is kind of irritating. <laughs> yeah, it's really not written for like, I'm really glad we have Veronica Tam and RM and Layla on our team because it, it is it's it's you really have to be in the in, ins and outs of these letters to really understand what they're getting at. So um, okay, so Staying the most, the majority of their comments were on our housing plan because they they really want to see um, deliverables. So, within Program One Point Three, they were asking for additional assistance to facilitate ADUs. So within that, we've committed to um, updating our prototypes to comply with building code every two years, and also updating our ADU guidance document with to be consistent with state law. Um, or any updates we do to our zoning code. Um, within program 1.4, this was, we um, we said we could expand our community benefit zone to key commercial corridors to facilitate, facilitate mixed use development. We did get comments on that uh, program 1.4 and they, um, YIMBY has uh, met with HCD as well and brought up their concerns regarding incentives for community benefits. And you recently got a, an updated letter from YIMBY as well. Um, and it's one area that they've been asking for us to modify. So really uh, the comments are based on looking at the impact of the community benefits so far on housing supply. And we haven't had any successful applications uh, since that went into place. So um, they're asking us to look at the application process, including the discretionary hearings, and also to consider uh, moving forward with more objective standards. Um, so um, in our recommended amendments, the recommended amendment will be to revisit the community benefits overlay and to incorporate objective standards and reevaluate those incentives that are included in there. Any questions on that slide? 
Um, well, I'll just ask my question uh, right now. I mean, I agree. I think that we need to, you know, revisit our community benefits ordinance. And I think uh, we do need to figure out what it's going to take, uh, particularly for the mall, which is such a huge part of our housing element, to actually come forward and redevelop and provide those housing units. But I guess I get a little confused because the city council just allocated money to study this and figure out with the developer, you know, what they're going to need to have in this community benefits overlay and, you know, what, what those objective standards are going to be. And so um, while I think we need to do it, I think we need to hear what the developer and this study comes up with as ideas for what they need to have to make this work, rather than us just trying to come up with what we think it's going to make it work. I mean, it, se it seems a little backwards to me. So Thank I, you. I, yeah, I just yeah. want the, because uh, I want the, our community benefits to actually generate something, and mm -hmm. just to uh, invent them out of the air without working with the mall developer isn't going to achieve that. And we're in the process of doing it. So anyway, sorry. Okay. No, I think, I think that actually leads into um, this next slide as well, because we have, we have more um, that that, I think that study will speak to. So within our program 1.6, this is looking at multifamily residential parking requirements. So that's something we'll be doing as a update to the code. Um, and then, and we did not get any new comments on that from HCD. So they, they're mm -hmm. satisfied with that commitment. And then within program 1.7, there's a new program for new shopping center redevelopment. So this, we mentioned the land use study that uh, Chair Westman just mentioned. So the land use study that we just got um, the contract signed and are moving forward for the mall redevelopment, but it, the um, the deliverables go further in and state that we'll develop land use policies and zoning development standards to facilitate subdividing, clustering, shared access, range of housing choices, and a strong sense of place and cohesive urban design within our objective design standards. So it does go a little deeper than. Um, it goes beyond that land use study to start prescribing what those next steps are. So um, we can discuss that in further detail towards the end. But, um, in terms of program 1.8, we were adding a new religious facilities housing program, and this is um, just to implement state law that was passed um, to allow um, units on religious facilities. And program 1.9 is a new uh, commitment to support our SB9 program. So within that commitment, it's really to one, provide counter hours for folks to come in and be able to meet with staff and talk about SB9. The second commitment is to create a guidance document similar to our ADU document to support SB9 and make it uh, easier for people to understand um, and that's it for that. What we heard from the state in our recent letter is for the new religious housing program, that they had concerns with us not meeting the, there's a requirement of 20 dwelling units per acre. Um, and then to, to also address the underutilized buildings, parking and where the new development will take place. So we're going to expand on our uh, explanation of the new religious facility housing program because really it, we're implementing what's required by state and we'll there's nothing that we really have to change it's just really um, providing more clarity for HCD about what we were proposing because the sites that we were proposing were well under what the uh, in terms of sites that we were identifying within our um, on our on our map, we're the number we're proposing is much less than could uh, the, than they could apply for under the new state law. So we just need to clarify 
that yes, we're we're basing it on underutilized parts of the properties within these churches or within existing structures. Um, also within the housing program, um, there was a request made by the public to encourage developers and contractors to hire local labor. We put that in. There's not a requirement for this because that could be seen as a barrier to housing. So it's just to encourage, um, but hoping that's effective. And program 4.2 is a commitment to our emergency rental housing assistant program. So this is our, we have this in play um, so that when someone's going through a crisis, there's a way to apply for emergency rental housing assistance to uh, not lose your home or your residency. And program 7.1 is uh, changes to the fair housing actions table, um, which were um, to support more housing for capital residents. So that's been done. Um, in terms of affirmatively furthering fair housing, um, we've updated this to include more um, description on the housing laws. We've also added a lot more um, of the information regarding residents and displacement and local knowledge. Um, so there's a lot more to this based on their request, HCD's request for more information. Um, we've updated all the tables and the maps and uh, we've prioritized contribute contributing factors. The one area that the HCD is asking for more information on is the new housing and mobility strategies. And this is what we discussed earlier. So really within AFFH is how do you create those additional opportunities within our single family and residential neighborhoods. So we'll be re revisiting low and medium multifamily zoning and uh, looking at the strategy for allowing duplexes on corner lots. So this is the final slide that kind of brings it all together of what we need to do prior to this final adoption. So number one, again, adding mobility strategies. I'd love the Planning Commission's feedback tonight on revisiting the density limits for low and medium density and allowing corner lots um, uh, to become duplexes as long as there's objective standards in place. Also uh, moving forward with an amendment to the community benefits overlay and then staff will be working on additional information for the mall, the religious sites, the small lot consolidation and our constraints. And then number four I've added, this isn't from the HCD comments, but it's from, uh, we need to manage this moving forward. And there's been so much added in this last, in these fast rounds of edits with the HCD that the dates that we had originally committed to need to be reevaluated to make sure that staff can um you every year we have to report on how on our progress uh, with our housing element and i just need to revise the timing for commitment so it's more realistic for our staffing so um so and that was actually an item I was going to bring up as well i mean there are so many commitments in this and so much work that needs to be done. I mean, the city is going to have to look at hiring another person because of the size of our planning department if if we're going to accomplish this. Even if you just look at the things that you know are going to be done in the next couple of years, because most of them require zoning ordinance amendments. And we all know what a problem that is because we've got not only does the city have to go through that whole process, but then we have to take the whole process through the Coastal Commission again, you know, which um, uh, creates time and, you know, burden and staff time. So you mentioned earlier that we had gotten some AMBAG grant for like $128,000. Is that like money we can use to, um, you know, uh, hire additional people to work on this and and i do think we need a realistic timing commitment because the last thing you know personally i want to do is promise we can do things that we know we can't do i mean i think we want to be genuine and we want to be honest about this and we want to come up with a housing element that is going to provide additional housing is going to work and you know it's going to be something that will facilitate 
more things being done rather than being artificial in any way. So anyway, sorry to interrupt you, but that's my, and you know, the same thing's true about the transit oriented development. You know, we need, we need to know what's going on so we can make appropriate changes. Yes. Okay, my last slide here is next steps. So I, I'm gonna bring the same update to city council next week with uh, any feedback from the planning commission that I get tonight. And then on October 19th, we have our special meeting and this is when we, uh, we've we put out the public notice for this, it'll be in the newspaper when the recommendation to city council on the housing element. And then after that, we do need to re-notice and state what the planning commission's direction was, the recommendation. And so we've got to wait till November 9th for that city council hearing for adoption. Our statutory deadline will be ahead of, it's December 15th. Um, so we're in a good place. And I do want to bring up though, we've all heard of Builder's Remedy in the past. There's uh, the, the HCD gets a 60 day period in which to review our update. So that will begin, we'll submit it on November 10th on that Friday. Um, so it'll be early January but, um, when their comments will be due back to us. In conversations with Veronica Tam, we will be requesting an expedited review and ask that they have their, uh, their review done by December 15th so that we won't be subject to builder's remedy. If they can't, um, provide that, they'll be, um, I think it's about a three or four week period that we would be subject to builder's remedy, but it's highly unlikely because the builder's remedy requirement for affordable units is higher than our inclusive. It's at 20%. Our inclusive is um, at 15% for affordable. And also you typically see builder's remedy come into play when you have a city that doesn't allow residential in many areas of their city. Capitola, we, we allow residential in almost all of our zoning districts except for open space. Um, and so we're, we're really in a good place to, uh, the risk there if we're to get this passed on the first go is is low to us for the builder's remedy. So I just wanted to bring that up. Um, so tonight I'm looking for um, planning commission comments and on the update and and then in preparation, um, I'm at, I would I'd like direction tonight to move forward with adoption hearings and any feedback on the next iterations proposed. So. So can we go back to the slide where you had the couple items listed that you wanted us to comment on? Yes, yeah. So and we should probably go out for, well, if you have questions, I can answer them, but we also should go out for public hearing. Okay, so do we want to sort of stop this and open the public hearing and then we'll come back and get comments from the commissioners. So uh, this is a public hearing item. So if there's anyone in the public or anyone on Zoom who'd like to come in, um, please come forward. Uh, you'll have three minutes to make your comments. And if you wanna give us your name, we appreciate it. Hello, commissioners. Uh, my name is Janine Roth and I am a lead with Santa Cruz EMB, which we've heard a lot about. Um, I want to first of all thank you for the discussion tonight, and I also want to thank um, Director Hurley for all the open conversations that we've had with her. It's been a very, um, it's been a very good dialogue. She's been open and responsive, and we see a lot within the evolution of the housing element. Um, I know there's a fair amount of information in the HCD letter. Um, if you look at our website, we've posted all of our input that we've provided to the city and also to HCD. A lot of it was around missing middle, around the analysis that they talk about, um, around the site inventory. I will note that uh, Santa Cruz used their REAP grant for a missing middle study. So I'll just let you know that, that that's something you talked about as well. Um, in your packet today, you see our input on the latest revision. Um, it is really, um, 
It's somewhat additive, but I want to say that it actually very well builds upon the amendments that Katie is presenting or Director Hurley is presenting tonight. Um, the first one relates to the development standards. And as the director put it, you know, Capitola should put the land use tools together so that private and nonprofit sectors can build. And as was also mentioned, the incentives for community benefits has actually not really been used to build anything. The incentives are not there um, for actual development. As well, your affordability fee, your affordable fee feasibility assessment that was done in 2020 or 2021 concludes that no rental development in Capitola makes sense. With an inclusionary rate, inclusionary fee, it, nothing makes sense. So our, our position is that there are constraints to development that should be addressed. And to Commissioner Westman's point of view, point, it's not, our recommendation is not that you prescribe the removal of those constraints in the housing element, but we think you have an opportunity to add to the program that looks at the community benefits and to leverage the work that's gonna be done for the mall to actually benefit development along the other transit corridors that you have. You have a lot of sites on 41st Avenue. You have a lot of sites on Capitola Road. But your review of the cap, oh, let me just go on. Um, the same thing for the inclusionary, that you have an opportunity to look at those incentives. Decreasing the processing time, use objective standards. It's as simple as that. I think I've, we've already heard it. The last thing on transit-oriented development, what we suggest is just come up with a very proactive statement in pursuing Capitola Mall as a high-quality transit area. It's very reactive now. We think you could be very proactive. We're encouraged by the conversations that Vice Mayor uh, Brown is already having or that we've had with her that it can be done. So let's be more proactive on that. And thank you all very much for um, your time on this. Thanks for being here. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to address us on this issue? Anyone on Zoom? Okay, seeing no one else, we'll close the public portion of the hearing and bring it back to the commissioners. Um, so um, uh, we lost Katie's chart, but the first item she had was about changing the zoning density in the um, low and medium density uh, residential areas. And, um, you know, I don't know how people here feel, but what I heard was it was not a huge change going from like 10 to 12 or um, that, which uh, certainly wouldn't be a problem for me. No, I'm not it, the state thinks it's 8.7 and going to 8, 10 or 12 would be probably a good thing for us to look at and see what impact that has. Although it's going to be, I think, ultimately fairly minor. And for me personally, I think doing duplexes on corner lots makes a lot of sense. I don't think that would, you know, have any particular negative impact. So, well, uh, what would be described as like a um, what's the comment? It was going to be objective standards. Look at that. What, what would that look like? Uh, well, I think the you know we've gone to objective standards, which means uh, we we no longer have these vague phrases like you know it should fit in the neighborhood, but come up with things that, you know, height's gonna be 27 feet, the setback's gonna be five feet, you know, some uh, objective standards that can actually be measured as part of making this change, uh, rather than just using the standards that would be used for a single family housing. You know, probably may have smaller setbacks, uh, gonna have to have two driveway, you know, there's differences between a duplex and a single family house. Yeah, I think I just want some clarification on that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think it would be about the orientation of the building to the street, the orientation to the parking, um, that there be, you know, so they, they kind of blend in with the single family uh, design wise, but also creating really clear standards so a developer knows what's expected of them when they come in with a project. Okay, so those, I remember those first two, what else do we need to give you comments on? 
Okay. Um, the next is amending the community benefits overlay. So this is really just revisiting our community benefits overlay, considering uh, more objective standards in there, as well as looking at what are the um, incentives in terms of heightened FAR and do we, you know, just reevaluating those as well. Well, I already said, I think that's something that we should do, but I think we need to, the changes we make need to be based on the information that we're going to get from, you know, this small study. So we have something concrete that we're actually going to work with, not just guess if buildings should be 48 feet high, 52 yeah. feet high, you know, we'll have something real that we can work with, but... Anybody, I'm sort of dominating the conversation, so if anybody has anything else, go ahead. I think that's a really important point, that, that when, when the applications come in, understanding the context of each density and the, how those objective standards fit each project would, would go a long way than us speculating. What else, Katie? The, the other items are really uh, our group just needs to provide more information. So um, the, the list of additional information had to do with the Capitola Mall, um, the re which I, I'm in communication with the Capitola Mall right now, trying to get more information on leases and phasing. Um, religious sites, we need to incorporate more information, which is just uh, those the assumptions that we made in identifying religious sites, like there's one on Capitola Road that has a single family home on the property. And we um, made the assumption that that single family home that they own could be, be have two units in it. So we just need to add the details of that. Also the details of the small lot consolidation. So we're putting together a new table and an explanation on the small lot consolidations. And then again, um, for the request on the, the items within our constraints section that they needed more information on. So um, aside from that, it's really then my request for the re re revisions to the timing commitments because I think we're overcommitted at this point and I need to uh, look at that and make sure we're grouping the right items that can be addressed within each year so that we can manage this project, uh, the implementation moving forward. Yeah, I, as I told you, I think in our meeting that I I agree with Commissioner Westman that we're, we're way over over promising on things that we can do in the next two years. I mean, we, with the staff we have and the workload we have just processing normal things, I don't know how we get all this stuff done. Yeah, I, I, I don't either. So hopefully if, you know, we can get a little information about like this grant, how that from AMBAG, could that be used to pay for some consultants to supplement our staff and, and how all that could work. And um, I would very much like to thank Katie and all of her team because I think they've done a pretty amazing job on putting this together. Uh, I will confess, though, it's not very environmentally friendly. I had to actually ask for a hard copy of the housing element to read because I was finding myself getting lost when I was reading it online and trying to go back and find things. I guess I need to do sticky notes and write things down. So uh, I would say if there are any of the other commissioners who would feel more comfortable actually having a hard copy, I don't think we need all the appendix stuff, but just the housing element itself for our next meeting, I think staff would be happy to accommodate you and provide you with that. Uh, is there anything else? Yeah, I have a couple more questions. Sure, go ahead. On, did, did we respond, did the city respond, I guess, to the Merlone Geyer letter of a couple of weeks ago? And, and can one of the, or it will one of the responses be the contractor, or I forget their name, doing the land use study? Are they going to involve uh, Merlone Geyer in that study? Yes. So I've been in contact with Merlone Geyer um, and for some of this additional information that we need. Uh, I think their comments were actually extremely helpful for us to understand those long-term leases, but now we need to get a little more detailed there. Um, we also provided some clarity to Merlone Geyer that um, one of the really uh, great updates within our last zoning code was that we're allowing multifamily 
on the same property as we, we, we kind of, um, if there's commercial on the site, you can put multifamily next to it. It doesn't have to be vertical. So your first story does not always have to be commercial. And, and then housing on top, it, it can be next to the site. So if um, if Coles were to want to put housing out front, they could. Malone Geyer wasn't understanding that. That was one of our updates to the code. It was something that they were asking for. So we have uh, provided response to them to clarify some of the items that just uh, their assumptions were incorrect and then also thanked them for the comments um, and have asked them for more information. So we are in contact and then I did let them know that Cosmont will be uh, reaching out to them regarding that study. So they'll they'll be involved. They won't sit on a technical committee, but they'll be involved, so. Okay, the other question, the state also, or HCD rather, uh, wants us to update our, or uh, actually add in realistic capacity analysis. You didn't talk about that, but I assume Veronica or somebody's going to go through this spreadsheet and anal analyze the likelihood of 100% non-residential development, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Yep. So that's part of our updated tasks. And um, so that will be included. Uh, Veronica seemed to think that we actually, uh, the information we have, have there is that, you know, more of our um, they've been smaller projects, but most of the projects we're seeing move forward in our commercial area. Uh, office space on Broomer that added two units above it. There is um, the furniture store, I think it's a real estate office on 41st Avenue that put another two units above it. So we are seeing the trend of adding uh, residential. So we're building that. And then of course the Capitola Beach Suites is a larger project with mixed use, but way more residential. So um, we'll be, We'll be responding to that, but it's not the trend that we're seeing for 100% commercial uh, projects coming in. So that's why we don't have evidence of that. So yeah, okay. and then lastly, probably more for my colleagues, I, I would request we put back in the two state sites that we had in the first draft: the park, state park, and the DMV. Even though HCD said take them out because that's state property, and you guys can't do anything. You can't tell us what to do with our property. Well, if they're going to tell us what to do with our city, they should at least talk to their colleagues in you know, the Departments of Public Works and, and or Parks and Recreation and uh, Department of Motor Vehicles. Because the DMV, as an example, is constantly moving to online everything. And they have a huge parking lot, which is, you know, an obvious target on a great, uh, in a great location. And we should just force the state to tell us that we're not going to do that in my I agree. Well, I, I personally agree with you that because I think the DM site is one of the better sites in Capitola to be redeveloped. Um, I do think at this point, you know, HCD sort of said we need to take those two sites out because, uh, but I think it's ridiculous that the state is, you know, going forward with all of this and because the state of California owns an enormous amount of property. And it seems like that they ought to be making some commitment to reuse some of their sites. But I, I would leave it up to Veronica and Katie to make that decision about whether they think that's a good move or a bad move for us. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that if you just, you can make a recommendation, <laughs> make it vocal. <laughs> You know, I have a suggestion. Okay. Um, you could direct me to add um, add a strategy that the city continue to reach out and try to engage with the state to create housing opportunity sites on their properties. And I, you know, with with like not really a deliverable other than us keeping, we can try to engage with them and keep that conversation going. And uh, then it's kind of up to them how they react, but without yeah, I think uh, we'll jeopardizing our, our, whether or not we'll get certified. So. What do you yeah. think about that? Paul? That's fine. That's, yeah. that's a, that's a reasonable politically correct compromise. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Katie. <laughs> Okay, so do we have anything else we need to discuss on the housing element tonight? 
I don't think so. So we will um, close this item. I think you've gotten direction from us, so you don't need a motion. Thank you, yes. And we will look forward to finishing our discussion on October 19th. At 6 p.m. 6 p.m. on October 19th. And I would like to thank the applicants at 421 Riverview Avenue for sitting here so patiently while we went through this item. And I am going to be leaving the meeting because I need to recuse myself because I live within 500 feet of this application, as did uh, Commissioner Wilk. And so I will turn the meeting over to... Um, the vice chair, and she will finish up tonight's meeting. Thank you all. Have a good evening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just catching up on my... Um... So for 421 Riverview Avenue, um, we, it is a design permit to construct a, de a detached garage with second story ADU. The application includes a variance request for the required front setback for detached garages, two ADU de deviations for the ADU required second story front setback and privacy mitigations, and an exception to exceed driveway width. The project is located within the R1 single family residential zoning district. The project is in the coastal zone and requires a coastal development permit, which is appealable to the coastal California Coastal Commission after all possible appeals are exhausted throughout the city. Um, and then we have a staff report. Thank you. I'd like to note that the site is also located within an identified flood hazard area. I think you covered everything else for my first slide. This is the existing site as it appears today. This is the proposed site plan. Uh, the, two, the new two-story structure would be located in front of the existing dwelling, shaded in green there, uh, with a breezeway connecting both the structures uh, on either side. These are the first and second story floor plans, garage on the right, ADU on the left. Uh, the new structure has a combined area of approximately 900 square feet. All habitable space is located in the second story, which does not have internal access to the garage. This is the proposed front and north side elevations. The new, stru uh, new structure has stucco siding to match the primary dwelling, a horizontal board accent on the front center, and metal and glass garage doors. Garage, yes, yes, excuse me. Uh, the breezeway continues the mansard tile roof pattern of the primary residence, and the shaded windows are, uh, indicate opaque window treatments for privacy along the north property side. And these are the proposed rear and south side elevations. So the, the variance uh, included in the application is to construct a detached garage within 20 feet of the front property line instead of the required 40 foot front setback for which is required for detached garages. The site is located within a excuse me, a special flood hazard area, which limits all new habitable space uh, construction to be above or at the base flood elevation or the 100-year uh, flood line. With the current site configuration, complying with a 40-foot setback would not be possible without de uh, demolishing some or all of the existing residents. Due to floodplain restrictions, those demolished habitable areas could not be rebuilt elsewhere at grade. As such, there are there are circumstances and limitations on the subject property that, that are unique to properties within the floodplain, which is one of the uh, primary findings that you would need to make. 
staff was uh, able to make that finding as well as all other supportive findings, including that the variance would not be a grant of special privilege. As noted in the report, this portion of Riverview Avenue has an irregular development pattern with Creekside homes having their principal elevations facing the creek rather than the street, and with the properties developed along closer to the street than is uh, commonly seen. The aerial shown above reflects the report analysis and identifies the south side or creek side properties that do not comply with the front setbacks for either the dwelling, detached garages, or both. The orange marks indicate those non-conforming dwellings. Marks in red indicate the non-conforming garages. And although the, the uh, studied area did not include the north side of the street, um, it even more visually can be seen to follow that similar trend of limited front setbacks. The first ADU deviation uh, is with respect to the second story front setback. To construct, it, to construct it at 18 feet from the front property line rather than 20 feet. Staff was able to make supportive findings for this request with similar considerations to, as to the variance request. Um, similar sized ADUs located on the ground level are typically approved administratively and with 15 foot setbacks due to the floodplain restrictions. This is not feasible on this lot as mentioned before. At its present size and location, the proposed ADU has limited alternative placement while meeting other setbacks and fire separation with the primary residence. It can be seen as being four feet from the north property side and five from the south, which are about as close as you can get. Uh, and it has similar setbacks from the, resident, the primary residence. This is the second ADU deviation request which involves a waiver of the objective privacy requirements on the south side of the structure. ADU standards require upper story windows within eight feet of a adjacent residential lot be either uh, clear story windows or have opaque treatments for light egress only. So this waiver affects two south side facing windows which wrap each corner of the ADU. Staff was also able to make supportive findings for this request due to the relative location of the adjacent residence. As you can see above, the, the new south facing uh, ADU looks towards the neighboring driveway and the front side of that residence, uh, which poses limited privacy impacts. This is the front half of the lot. The applicant is proposing to remove four olive trees that are on the corners of the driveway, two towards the, the primary residence, two towards the street. The applicant is proposing to replant two trees towards the street in similar locations. And the uh, rearward removals are directly related to the uh, proximity to the new structure, as well as the required egress for both units going around the structure. Um, and the Two forward ones are proposed just in conjunction with the revised driveway and landscaping. This would meet the required canopy coverage for, for development applications. I'm just going to hold for one moment. The final thing that staff would like to bring up is in respect to the landscape and the driveway requirements in the R1 zone. New driveways in this zoning district are allowed uh, widths up to 40% of the lot width, up to 20 feet, except that driveways may be at least 14 feet wide. This property has a lot width of 30 feet and an existing driveway of 21 feet, uh, which is well in excess of what would be allowed, uh, which is 14 feet. Project would replace the existing asphalt driveway with semi permeable pavers and reduce that width to 20 feet, which again still exceeds the allowed 14 feet of, for this lot. Planning Commission may, however, allow larger driveway widths when it, if it finds that the landscaping uh, has been designed to enhance the site and minimize visual impacts to the neighborhood. The proposed landscape 
plan does not include uh, or specify any natural ground cover beyond those two mentioned replacement trees as well as two large potted plants. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission consider whether the site plan uh, proposes landscaping sufficient to meet that visual requirement. And as an alternative, staff suggests that the Commission consider adding the following condition of approval, which I've, I'll just read to you now, that prior to issuance of a building permit, the applicant must include a landscape plan and revised site plan that it reduces the driveway width to 18 feet, requires soft landscaping along the sides of the driveway, uh, the front landscaped areas must include natural vegetation, the majority of which are planted um, rather than uh, planted in the ground rather than in pots or, or some sort of raised area. And so with that, staff recommends that to consider whether to approve the project as proposed with the attached conditions and findings or to require landscape modification. Thank you, staff. Um, is the applicant present? No. Good evening, honorable members of the Planning Commission. I'm Dennis Norton. I represent uh, Steve and uh, Alois um, Owens, who are actually in the audience here right now, too. And, um, you know, if you ask anybody who lives on the street here, they'll tell you their front yard is the river. And so that's really how those houses are designed. Uh, the zoning, unfortunately, has been a mismatch over years. Um, if you say that you need to have 40 feet for a detached garage, there's no other house on the street that can do that. Nobody has 40 feet. So you cannot have a, a, a detached garage in any of those properties. But as, you, as the map was shown by staff, is that... that 80% of the properties in this thing are not conforming to the front setbacks. It's not, it's not unusual for Capitola, but this area particularly, uh, do it. Um, we, we, uh, we support the, the staff conditions. We have questions about, um, that's a narrow road there, and making a turning radius into two, two spaces is tough enough. I think we narrow it down with, with too much landscaping. We can put a four foot on both sides, put a 20 foot wide. It gives a little room for us to give a, a, a a, uh, a turning radius coming off that street because it's uh, the street is not even too car wide, so we need some kind of radius that we can work with that planner or allow us to pull maybe the planner back 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 a little bit. We're not against having planners, We're not against staff report. We we accept the conditions of approval, um, and uh, I, I think it's a good project. And if you and we've been talking about ADUs all night, it's a perfect example of where ADUs do fit. And there can be more on that street there, but, you, but there's going to have to be some concessions all along. So we appreciate your consideration of the variance, uh, variances, and um, and uh, uh, thank you for consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before you leave, uh, a follow-up question. So could you just um, elaborate on what you're talking about with the planner? I'm sorry. Um, because up. of the, the road being real narrow. Yeah, so can we, can we can you bring up the slide you'd be referring to? And what staff is recommending is 18 foot for two cars to approach in there. That's really, really tight, considering that we need to have some kind of radius to get off the street. So we're asking that we will do planners on both sides, um, as suggested, but we would like to have 20 foot, 20 feet in width there. And that's really your normal car size in the city is that you call for in your codes is, is 10 by 20. And so that gives us exactly what that, that is right there. Uh, other than that, uh, uh, we, we agree with the uh, staff's presentation. Thank you. Sorry, but you made an additional comment and said, or if that wasn't possible, they could be shortened? Is that when you're... Yeah, we, we, can, we can move the planners back a little bit and make them a little shorter so we have that radius to get in there. But um, if, you, if you see, if you, and you, I'm sure you've walked that street many times, but, but there's no parking along that street that parallels the thing. So you need the offsite here. In this case... We're providing a small house with an ADU with four parking spaces or beyond what's required 
but uh, but we feel that, that this is a good use of this property in the front. And we're going to take it all out. We're going to do pavers in the front. So we'll be changing the landscape considerably. What we had designed was to one side do a, a four-foot bo box planter, uh, adding to tree on both sides, and then doing some some uh, design-type um, containers uh, along the side there to give it some architectural feature on the other side. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. That was great. <laughs> I, do you have any further questions? I think we skipped over the questions from the The only other question was the you commission. tinted windows in on the south side. Pardon me? If tinted windows in the, on the south side instead of... Yeah, yeah. well, it, what it is is they're, they're only to the front ones, and there there's nobody... There's a single-story house back behind it. So it's our south exposure. I mean, we need to have some sun in there. And so we've already el eliminated the ones... Everything that's on the north side is eliminated. And it's just this, the the um, the east and and the uh, and the south, and it's only the windows that are towards the front of the building, not in the back. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I think we did skip over the commission <laughs> comments and questions in the beginning. But um, is there any more questions for staff? Oh, I just wonder if they would mind commenting on what was proposed about um, widening the driveway. I mean, I think it'd be good to have that feedback or if there's... Sorry, could you uh, say that again? Well, with the, you know, right now showing 18 feet where I hear is that they're asking like, could it go to 20 or would the planners be shortened? I mean, is there feedback from the staff on what your thoughts are for that? As to why we are recommending 18 feet rather than 20? Yeah, well, I mean, or if we went to 20, what would, I mean, obviously I know it's two feet, but I mean, is there any additional things that we're, I mean, overlooking? So the, the uh, suggested condition, it, it was a, a way that we felt that would better meet that visual requirement that I read. I can read that for you again. It was in the re report that basically says that the landscaping and surface area should be enhanced such that it minimizes the visual uh, uh, impact that the excuse me that the driveway has on the street. So the larger it gets, the more of an impact it has. So the more you would need to do to offset it. That recommended condition would do a number of things, including add to the required amount of landscaping they'd have on the sides of the driveway, as well as reducing the driveway. Uh, modestly so that it would reduce that impact. So it approaches that consideration from both ends. Okay, thank you. Um, did, was there any consideration for other, I mean, I, I know that you were showing the, the site area across the different driveways, but in terms of the consideration of the driveway width, you know, being 18 or 20, does it, there's a lot of other driveways that are pretty much go from end to end, is that like a, that was in consideration, right? Uh, that wasn't something we looked at because looking at examples of uh, similar nonconformities in a neighborhood isn't a required finding like it would be for a variance. Yeah. This is something that's written in the code that simply specifies the planning commission does have the discretion to allow a different uh, width provided it can make the finding that uh, it would, it's designed to minimize the visual impact. That's the only finding that would need to be made here. So if, if we required planters or softscape on either side, it would be, I mean, reasonable to ask for a 20-foot driveway. I mean, reasonable. <laughs> Potentially, yes. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify. Um, do we have any more questions? No, I, I could go. Um, will I make a... Well, I think we have to open to the public hearing. Oh, sorry. sorry. Well, I, well, I like a, well, a follow-up question. Oh. Just around is if there's a way that, that if we were going to, as a commission, say, address that other than tonight to say one way or the other where we go, would that be something that they could go back and we could direct them to work with the applicant to see, like, um, if turning raises are an issue around that, um, could that be addressed and looked at from maybe different, maybe the, the uh, architect could draw up a different layout and how attorney's radiuses work in some way if the planner board is 
boxes were pulled back, maybe that would help soften up the area, but also meet staff's issues. So I just wondering how, just from a process standpoint, how that could be handled at the same time before we went out. Would that be addressed in a landscape plan? <laughs> it, it certainly could be if you'd like to uh, provide a, a different condition of approval, for example. Um, maybe specified that the staff has some flexibility with uh, where to allow that or to allow some sort of uh, apron area, tapered, either tapered front, perhaps to make that difference at the front so that it, at the very edge of the street, it's 20 feet wide, that drops to 18 within the first three feet or so. Yeah, thank you. I was just wondering how that would could it, could it be included, I guess, tonight. Um, do you have any more questions? Do we open up to the planning hearing? The, does, yep. Let me speak. My name is Dean Matsuo. I own the property at 419 Riverview to the south of the proposed um, units and the, the, the property. And we didn't really have a problem with the unit and what Steve wanted to do, the, the owners wanted to do with that. The problem is between the two homes, um, Dennis touched on it, the homes are very eclectic, the way people built them. Um, the owners, we both bought about the same time. Um, the owners prior looked like they had an arrangement where we have an arch on the side of our home that goes to the side and into the back because the entrance is actually in the back. Mm -hmm. So there's a courtyard there, and we share the, the property. And his property line is actually, our arch is on his property line, we found out after the fact. And on the advice of my attorney, he said that we should try to resolve this. Um, I sent them a, um, an email last week. Uh, stating that we'd like him to try to work so that we don't have to remove the arch and incur the cost. I do believe that when we put something permanently affixed to our home, we have to get a permit and so on and so forth. So we're looking at probably five to $10,000 to do this, to make the arch. And first we asked for it not to be touched and then just to pull his setback back, pull his, his property back and work around that. We didn't hear back. The second option was to, we would flip the arch, move it out so that it matched up. If he pulled his gate back, he wants to put a gate on the side. If we put a gate there, his gate there, we would put our arch up against that or next to it on our property, we would move it. But um, we've reconsidered that. That is not an option for us. We, it still is, but if he'll foot the bill for it, because if it's five to $10,000, this project is worth whatever he wants to do with it, then it's going to be worth five to $10,000 to go ahead and do that. Otherwise, we'll seek other remedies to, to resolve this issue. Um, it, it is, you know, um, a, uh, we think a, a solution, we can find a solution. We have the owner that we bought from is still alive. Sally Bookman is still in the area. And we can talk to her about it. And so we know that we can still go that route if we have to. But that was our suggestion to him. We're still open to that. The other thing, I don't know if they realize this, but and I may, be, I may be wrong, but once they do put an ADU on that unit, it no longer can be a short-term rental from what I've read. So um, we're in a special zone that we can rent out by the week, and I know that Steve likes to rent his place out, but I don't know if they've taken that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dennis, did you want to... Yeah, go ahead. You attempted to be cooperative with Mr. Dean. I sent him three different designs for this. We're not denying him access to the gate. What we're doing is we're putting the whole gate on our property because he hasn't agreed to let us go onto his two-foot strip on his side. He's not offering, you know, full half access. He's offering one quarter of the access. But uh, uh, the Owens said, okay, we'll just build the gate on our side, and he can have access to his backyard just like it is. We're offering him everything that he could want, and it doesn't need to connect to his house. And right now, it does connect to his house. We offered him that alternative. Then we did another one where it split the difference of the property lines. Both rejected. So we came down to this one here. What we want to do 
is we're going to put all the all the gateway onto Steve's Steve Owens's property 421, and still offer them the access to get to their backyard or to their side yard. So we're not taking anything from. We're offering them a pretty good alternative, considering he he gets rights to go across the property. Then, and as soon as somebody brings up attorneys and you know in discussions with me, I just I'm gone. <laughs> I don't want to. You know, okay. The site plan says uh, remove. Yes. Existing mark, mark, right? Yes, we're going to remove it and then put all the gate on onto Steve Owens's property. We're doing all the favors in the world for this gentleman. So you're moving this. You're physically moving the existing uh, arch, roughly two feet to the north. That is correct. Yes. And, and that's what it shows on my site plan. So now you need attorneys to give him, you know, uh, whatever it's called, perpetual access to the. Their he can. They can go do that. But what we're offering him is a pretty good bundle here. That he doesn't have to use his, any of his property. He doesn't have to attach to his property to his house. And we're offering him full access through the gate. So he, 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 he can, if he wants to legally gain that, he can do that. So you're offering basically to it's you're, to keep what's there existing, not to remove the, the arch. No, no, it was, what's there now, it splits the property line. It's about one foot onto his property, and it's two feet onto Steve's property. Because most of the walkway there is in Steve's property. There's there's five feet on one side and a foot and a half on the other. He doesn't have a walkway back there. Right. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. But what we're doing, we're not denying him to have a walkway. We're going to put a new gate in. We're going to put it on Steve's property, and he's going to have access to it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is that? I'm a little. <laughs> one okay, one more thing. <laughs> we actually have photos that show that the. Previous property owners, uh, when they put in the concrete, how they put the concrete up, Steve's property, they put a small strip. The rest of the property was paved by people that had our home because it's all the way back. So we already have photos. We've already talked to attorneys. They say, yes, there's easements. So if they'd like to go, you know, if they don't want to go legal, we don't want to go legal. But what they've done right now, and, and it isn't true, they sent one drawing out that said remove the archway, and we weren't told. They were just told we were removing your archway. You need to take it down. The second one they sent, we had to beg to get it. And so there was no third one. And we didn't get a response back to we were actually going to pay to move the archway. But then I saw on the agenda that it said that you were going to give an exception to his driveway width. And I'm thinking, okay. Speaking to the microphone. Thank and the driveway width. And I'm thinking, well, how does that impact now what you're doing here if you have to do that but again we didn't have a problem with him wanting to put his adu up it, it's just that easement area and right now if he if he wants to go that route we can go that route it's fine with us understood understood okay so i think this isn't the the pathway easement isn't really even addressed within the staff report i mean except for the, the archway being encroaching on somebody else's property and or the neighbor's property and is that, I mean, is this even within the staff purview? <laughs> this is a little beyond the, uh, the scope of the staff report. Uh, earlier submittals did include a uh, more of a good neighbor gate that straddled the property lines. Mm -hmm. And our input to the applicant was that if that was going to be a, an explicit part of this project, that they should also include a... Um, an agreement, a legal agreement between both property owners to allow shared use of it. So subsequently, because we did hear that there was a difficulty in, in obtaining that in this timeline, they modified their plans to show a gate entirely and fence on entirely on their property. So that uh, comment was removed from from their our review. And that's so there was it. exchange and there was residence. There was exchange between the staff and the applicant, that's okay. all. Um. Um, so Commissioner well. Christensen, I just want to make sure that we've closed the public hearing. Okay, at, thank you. Okay. And I, I just wanted to just expand upon uh, what Planner Sasanto is saying. So when, when the development is on a single, as long as their development proposal is wholly within their property, we can move forward. Previously, there was a shared gate proposed in which we would require 
access agreements and maintenance agreements. So at this point, because this proposal is wholly within their property and they have a right to do to to develop their property, um, we're okay with this application moving forward because it's no longer a shared access proposed within the development proposal. So understood. So I'm, now I'm really confused. It's a site <laughs> plan shows what looks like an arch that covers it's about 50 50 on each property so these people are going to remove the part of the arch that's on their property and leave the other part of the arch hanging is that what the proposal is sean can you bring can, up you the take, uh, front facade the the view of the front facade, front facade. yeah there's a fence and gate We have the proposed elevations in the uh, presentation. Is that what you were referring to? Or I was thinking just uh, from the street view. Just so we can see this, the gate. I see the, the little archway. So it's a little hard to see. We could we could magnify that for you, but yeah. you can see the archway. Mm -hmm. um, can you share your screen, Sean, so I can see? Okay. So in, in terms of moving forward with the application, because what they are proposing is on solely on their property, um, the Planning Commission can move forward with it, but how they resolve that gate will have to be between uh, neighbors um, and working together. Um, because that that's a private property matter where they have a shared gate. And my my understanding from uh, the knowledge that we had is that we we didn't uh, have any evidence of an easement. So if there is an easement there, then this may modify the plans. And they, um, if development is proposed in the area where the gate is, or they'd have to follow that easement. Um, From and Sean, my understanding is that there, from staff's knowledge, there's no easement in place. We were suggesting an easement prior uh, for the maintenance and access if they were to have a shared gate. So this this will have to be resolved uh, between the two neighbors, independent of the application. Okay, thank okay. you. That makes sense. Do um do we want to bring it back to any more discussion, or are we ready to make a motion? Anybody want to make a motion? Yeah, I was going to make a motion for approval um, with the condition that um, we ask staff to work with the applicant on um, the issue that was brought up about the width of the driveway from the 18 to 20 feet. If that's going to the 20 feet, or if there's a way that um, you know the planner box can be shortened, that everybody can come together with a, a proposed solution around that. So uh, to, let me understand, because I, I agree with Architect Norton, this street is pretty crowded, so the turning radius issue is a, is a difficult one off of Riverview onto the property. You're saying build, basically have a, an angle to be 20 feet at the street and then angling down to 18 as you go towards the ADU? Well, I think there's two things I heard um, was to go to 20 feet or that those planter boxes were shortened so that it would help with the turning radius. So one of those two options can be worked out. But to me, uh, what staff was concerned about was aesthetics, I, what I think I heard, mostly around. And then I hear the applicant saying they, the turning radius. So if that could be, they come to agreement and the turning radius can be addressed by a shorter planner. And so that both parties worked. I thought that was great. If it can't be, you know, then if the 20, I can be fine with either one. But I'd like to see both kind of resolve. We'll see what we can yeah, no, work together. I understand. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So I can, I'll second that motion. Is that clear in terms of a motion? 
of he, they get two options? Yeah, sure. I, we, okay. I think that's clear. Or you could just specify flexibility within a certain distance from the front property line if you just want to put that in. I just don't know what that would be. What that would look like. I mean, I, I don't. You know, I don't think we need to see a turning radius. I would think that between everybody, I work it out together. I, I would hope. So, so sorry, that, sorry, I'm not being clear, but I, I wouldn't want to so say pull back five feet because if that still doesn't work, you know, I don't. So as long as the turning radius is identified, that that you'd be comfortable with with approving a wider driveway or a right, wider apron, is that? Yes, cool? thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, that, that makes sense. We could just add with accommodation for a turning radius um, after the 18-foot requirement. Would that be acceptable? Yeah, I, I would think that would be fine with me. And I, I, I could go with that. Anything to add? No. no that, that's probably good language. Okay, so we have a first and a second. Um, do we want to take... <laughs> A roll? Or is that a, how do we do this with two, uh, two, three commissioners? I don't think I've been present when it was just three of us. Just a roll call? Okay, roll call. <laughs> Commissioner Esty. Aye. Commissioner Jensen. Aye. And Vice Chair Christensen. Aye. Okay, so um, with that, I think that concludes all items on the agenda that we've, we've gone through. Um, we have, they, we already did the director's report in the beginning. Okay, so uh, commission communications. Did we do that as well in the beginning? We had a little bit of a mix-up, so I'm going down the you, list. You, you could still open up commissioner communications. Commissioner communications? Okay. Um, any commissioner communications? Just a question. Is there any update on when, um, sorry to keep asking, but the proposed uh, layout or what would look like from um, outdoor world we talked about that in the past do you have any updates when that might be um, I know there's gonna be some conversation with I think RM or somebody or was going to be doing one of those so I I can answer that one um, the design team has not been focused on that although it is a deliverable within our housing element update so um, is there is there a preference on timing for that that you'd like to see? I mean, it 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 should be done by the next hearing, but um, no. Uh, and I totally appreciate staff's time. All I was hoping for is that it would come before us before there's another project, and so that it wasn't like at the same meeting and then we're showing something. Just so I guess maybe a, a, a neutral. Um, or just an overview um, informational meeting on what a project would look like before there was a project on the same agenda. Okay. I, I'm hoping that is completed by the October 19th special meeting because it's one of their deliverables within their project. But I'm, they haven't, um, I'll, I'll ask for another update on that. So, but hopefully you see it on the 19th. Okay, yeah, and just to be clear, it's just mostly just when I, I think you're talking about uh, there's another affordable project coming through, um, and I would just, would just, I don't know what that time frame looks like, but it'd be nice to have this, you know, actually working through the housing element update, if this could just come before that, if you're, if you have like a master plan that you're looking at. Excellent. Yep. Um, okay, anything else? Nope. Good. Okay. And we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.